Well, good morning, Camelback Bible Church. We're so glad you've joined us this morning, whether here in person or joining us on live stream this morning. If you're a guest with us this morning, a special welcome. We encourage you to fill out a visitor card. What that does is it gives us a little information about who you are and what you're looking for at a church and how we as a church focused on Jesus, community, and mission can serve you. Well, as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship, let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you and give you thanks that we can gather and worship you this morning. We ask that our sole focus this morning is on you and your glory. We pray that the busyness of this week, all of our distractions subside, and that we can focus on worshiping you with our full hearts, souls, and minds. As we get to sing about your goodness and hear your word through scripture and prayer and the sermon. Father, I give you thanks that we can gather this morning. May we worship you well and may we be edified. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, the psalmist tells us in Psalm 95, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. So this morning, let's stand as we sing together and we sing about the great things God has done in his creation and our salvation.
standing as we pray. Father, we do praise you that you are a God of truth. Father, there is no deceit in you, no darkness, no lying. In you is light that reveals the truth, that reveals your goodness, that reveals your glory and your righteousness and your holiness. Father, your ways, all of your ways are right. They are merciful and gracious. You call us to holiness because you are holy. You call us to love because you are love. You call us to righteousness because you are righteous. We praise you that you are trustworthy. You don't change and you're never wrong. Your ways are above our ways. And Father, as we consider these things, we realize that we do not follow you like we should. We confess that we are often of little faith, tossed by fear and lies. We confess that we often seek joy in comfort or leisure rather than truth and righteousness. Forgive us for seeking security and control and power rather than in the truth of your love and your word. Father, forgive us for times that we consider only our own way and not your way. So Lord, now we look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Children, you may be dismissed.
Father, we have affirmed your worth, your glory this morning, uh, your works, which are magnificent. We've been reminded, O oh Lord, that in Jesus we're, we're forgiven, we're pardoned. We've been restored to relationship. And that means we can come to you with our petitions as we do now. Father, I want to pray for our church family that we would grow in unity and in love. We live in a world that is so fractured. We see so much evidence of your creatures that were made in your image, hating one another, hurting one another. And so, Father, help us to be that city on a hill, a light to the world, putting on display the very unity and love that is characteristic of your triune person. And Father, we know if this is going to be a reality, that we will have to be pursuing a deepening relationship and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, give us hearts like the Apostle Paul, who considered all things as loss, save the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Help us to pursue a true knowledge and relationship with Christ that results in a way of thinking about and living in this world that mirrors your matchless Son. And Father, we pray that this knowledge of your Son would then impact our marriages and our families. Let our children see husbands and wives who put the interest of the others before themselves. Let them see a quality of character. Let them see a strength and joy even in the midst of trial that compels them to want to know and to embrace the Christ of truth. Father, we pray that you save our youth, our young people, as they're launching out. Save them from imbibing the false ways of our culture. Help them to plant their identity in Jesus Christ. Help them to know your good and perfect way and to follow it in all their relationships, in all of their endeavors. And Father, give us a concern for others beyond our families, beyond our church family. Open our eyes, even our hearts, O oh Lord, to see those who are walking on the broad road, a road that's leading away from your presence, that leads sadly to destruction. Father, give us a compassion to work toward their seeing Christ and knowing him personally. And Father, for some specific needs of our body, even now, we lift to you as well. We pray for some that are fighting COVID. We think of the Druid family, three of them hospitalized, oh Lord. Pray for another uh, gentleman in our body who just got a cancer diagnosis. We pray for those that are suffering the loss of loved ones and those who are dealing with loneliness, some depression, oh Lord, and anxiety. Oh Father, draw near to each. And let them find in Jesus a sufficiency. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, at CBC, we talk about being stewards of all that God has given to us. Stewards of our time, our talent, and our resources. And this morning, we wanted to bring up a, a man who... Um, who is really stewarding his time and talent in a wonderful way. And uh, I know this man, I work with him uh, in Lagos on, on Wednesday, and uh, I know he wouldn't want to tout his horn, but I, I felt his story would be encouraging us. So John, I want to encourage you to come on up. Thank you. Well, John, I know very much behind the scene that you are uh, stewarding your time and talent in a very significant way. Uh, tell the body a little bit about what that entails. Uh, thank you, Ron. Um, so what that entails is um, I've been serving in a way for our widows, um, some of our older couples who are no longer able to either financially or physically uh, be able to maintain their homes. Um, been doing it for some time. I was sharing with Ron. I was remembering back the first time it happened, and it was over 20 years ago. 
I was working here at the church and we had a congregate whose washer dryer unit, it was all one, the washer needed repair and it was close to a $300 repair, but believe it or not, it was just a $5, $6 part that needed to be replaced. So it was all labor. Um, they recognized in my youth I had this mechanical ability and figured it was a long shot, but give the kid a try and see if he could fix it. And I was able to, but uh, I was able to see God's blessing through that. Um, see how service of time and whatnot can just glorify God's kingdom and be able to uh, bring us all closer together. Jan, tell us the why, the motive behind this. Um, the why and the motive. I'll be honest, the older I get and the more I'm reading the Bible, I really see that service to God, service to our body is honestly interlaced in the underlying theme. I uh, think to um, basically First Peter 4, where it says we are stewards of God's grace and we are to use our talents, our resources to serve the body. I think of Matthew 25 when um, Christ is talking about the final judgment and he talks about how we've clothed, we've fed, we've quenched thirst, we've um, visited people who are poor or people who are imprisoned and, cry, and he says, it's like we have done it unto God. We have served our Lord in those actions. That's beautiful, Jan. Jan, uh, tell us, um, what effect have you seen uh, that comes out of your stewardship of your time and talent? Um, most of all, hopefully, just a growing and a glory to God in the work that is actually done. Um, lifelong relationships. Um, people that I've you know, been able to serve or whatnot. It's just, you create a special bond. You know, some of the times when I'm there working, I just sit there and listen to them, you know, and they want to talk. They want to grow together. They want to talk about Christ, which is absolutely spectacular. Um, the third one, um, I kind of was talking how it was accidental, but I am totally and wholly grateful for it. So when I was doing this, a lot of the times our son, Jesse, would come along and my main purpose was to teach my son how to maintain a house or how to do these things and how to grow. But through it, um, now in his older age, he's 22, I'm getting ready to graduate here. And one of the things he expressed to me actually just about a month or two ago we were talking is that he was looking forward to finishing school because he wanted to serve with his dad again and be able to do this. So that's just phenomenal. We're seeing God's fruit, or I and blessed to be able to see God's fruit in one of my children through the service. So one of the reasons I'm up here sharing this is we are trying to grow the men's ministry right now, and we want to see this happen in fathers and sons, more specifically in our men's ministry. And we have an opportunity coming up on November 20th February. to, what's that? February. February. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Did I say November? Sorry, I had COVID. I'm going to call it COVID brain. So <laughs> February 20th, to be able to serve um, at the, I always forget the name, or say it wrong, Creighton, Creighton Foundation, Creighton Foundation yeah. who serves one of the local school districts that's more um, impoverished. And this wasn't the start of his ministry, but through COVID, he started a food um, distribution. So every single Saturday, he packs food for two hours, and then he basically distributes food for two hours to the local people around there. Um, I know this is kind of more of a younger group, so I'll say it a little bit more strongly. I really, really, guys, grab your sons and come out and do this service. We need to plant the seeds in our kids so we can see that mature and grow as God actually waters them. Yeah, so that's February 20th, uh, a workday, 8 to 12. If you can only come for a couple of hours, we've got a uh, couple hour slots. Um, but we want to we wanna show our, our young men uh, that we use our strength to help others. Um, and so uh, you need to sign up on the Church Center app so that we know we've got ample people to help and uh, make this happen on, on the 20th. Another way that we uh, steward is we steward with our resources our finances, and because of COVID, we don't take a collection, but we know many of you have been so generous in your giving online and uh, giving uh, as, you, as you leave and so on. And, uh, but right now, just musically, we want to think about our stewardship of time, talent, and treasure 
uh, ultimately just giving God uh, all that he's given to us and giving it back, back to him. Let me pray. Father, thank you. Uh, you've given so much to us in your son, Jesus Christ. You've given us all that we have, life and health and breath. And we have a privilege, O oh Lord, uh, to give back to you with our time, talent, and treasure. May those be acts of worship, O oh Lord, with which you are well pleased. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to be encouraging us to pray for uh, Pastor Jim, who is away for these two, uh, two weeks, as uh, he wants to pour into his studies in the book of Psalms. 
uh, which is going to be the next uh, scriptures that we'll be studying together. Uh, next week, Pastor AC will be preaching, and today is Benji's first day at church. Pastor AC and Lauren, good to have you. Good to see AC with that baby in his hand, like a football. We are thrilled for you guys. Well, during World War II, the U.S. government created the U.S. Office of War Information. And one of the roles was to call people to action. The leaders knew that if the war was to be won, everybody needed to be committed. Everybody needed to be involved. And one tactic they used to call people to action was placing posters throughout the country. Perhaps one of the most iconic posters shows a picture of Uncle Sam with his finger pointed, accompanied by the words, I want you for the U.S. Army. It was a call to enlist. There were other calls as well. There were calls to work hard so that more ordnance could be delivered to the front lines. There were calls to conserve resources. You know, during a wartime, you can't waste resources. You've got to use them well. There were even calls to save waste fats that could be used for explosives. The leaders knew that success required not only admiration of the war effort, but direct engagement. And so they put forth many calls to action. Well, in a similar, similar manner now, we enter the portion of the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, verse 13, where Jesus extends a call to action. He's given his auditors some amazing teaching, the Beatitudes, instruction on prayer and fasting and giving, training about money, anxiety, and judging. He's laid out the intended lifestyle for the new community that he was forming, but he was looking for more than admiration. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, it's not praise he desires, it's practice. The Sermon on the Mount is not to be commended, it's to be carried out. Again, Lloyd-Jones says, the Christian message is not some theoretical idea. It is something that really is to become characteristic of our daily life and living. This is the purpose of the remainder of this sermon. And so to what does Jesus call his hearers? Well, we find the first application in verses 13 and 14. Open your Bible to uh, Matthew chapter 7. We'll look at verses 13 and 14 first. Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. And so we're confronted in these two verses with the proverbial fork in the road. A choice is given two ways, not three ways, not many ways, all leading to the same place as some might suggest. No, it's a choice not all that dissimilar to, the, to a choice given to God's people in history. Moses declared to the people, See, I have set before you this day life and good, death and evil. Therefore, choose life that you and your descendants may live. Joshua, at the end of his days, challenged his people, saying, Choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, how does it end? We will serve the Lord. Jeremiah, relaying the message of God, said, And to this people you will say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. We see the same binary choice in Psalm chapter 1, several times in the book of Proverbs. And now we see it on the lips of Jesus. And what are the two ways to which Jesus draws attention? 
where the first way is described as wide and spacious. It's an easy, pleasant, agreeable way. And besides, there's no lack of companionship. It's a road much traveled. I actually think there are two versions of this way. One is non-religious, and the other is religious. John Stott well describes the non-religious version. He says, there is plenty of room on it for diversity of opinions and laxity of morals. It's the road of tolerance and permissiveness. It has no curbs, no boundaries of either thought or conduct. Travelers on this road follow their own inclinations. That is the desires of the human heart in all of its full fallenness. Superficiality, self-love, hypocrisy, false ambition, censoriousness. These things do not have to be learnt or cultivated. Effort is needed to resist them. No effort is required to practice them. That is why the broad road is easy. C.S. Lewis in his autobiography describes his travels on the broad road when as a schoolboy of 13 years of age he decided to broaden his mind. He states, I was soon, in the famous words, altering I believe to one does feel and oh, the relief of it. From the tyrannous noon of revelation, speaking of the revelation of God, I passed into the cool evening twilight of higher thought, where there was nothing to be obeyed and nothing to be believed except what was either comforting or exciting. That's the essence of the broad road. But there's a religious version of it as well, which Jesus has actually been battling in the Sermon on the Mount. It's the way of the so-called righteousness of the Pharisees, which seeks to make easy the exacting standards of our Lord's holiness. The Pharisees in their heart of heart knew that they could not keep God's law. And so they manipulated it and minimized it, reducing it merely to external behaviors. But in chapter 5 of Matthew, Jesus dismantles and exposes the bankruptcy of their false way. He says over and over, you have heard it said. You know what the religious leaders are saying all about this, but I'm telling you what this really means. And he goes back and forth. You have heard it said, but this is what I say to you. Showing them that their system of religion was neglecting the heart. You know, sometimes when we present the gospel as an event and not as a lifestyle, we're doing the same thing. All you've got to do is accept Jesus in your heart and you're good to go. Leaving the implicit suggestion that the gospel doesn't bring demands on the way that we live. Or sometimes if we don't like what the Word says, we interpret it in a new way in order to please our desires. I've had people in my office who said, I, I, I think God wants me to be happy. That verse can't mean what it says. This way, this religious way, can also be characterized by ritual over against loving your neighbor. It satisfies oneself with religious activities like going to church, reading my Bible, saying my prayers, giving my offerings, usually in an attempt to make oneself acceptable to God. But as we look into scriptures, we see that the prophets and Jesus suggest that these things are easy to do, but when unaccompanied by love of neighbor, they don't constitute true religion. In fact, they are condemnable without it. Look at Isaiah chapter 1. He declares that the Lord is weary of your ritual when it's not accompanied by love of your neighbor and care and concern for them. That's the easy road. In contrast, Jesus offers an alternative path. 
It's described as a narrow way, which is to say it's restricted. It's described as hard, meaning difficult, subject to persecution and distress. And to make things more challenging, there are few who join us on this way. And how is it that this is hard? Well, Martin Lloyd-Jones compares the narrow gate to a turnstile. Something like you might uh, encounter in an airport or train station. Some years ago, Ruth and I went to England, and uh, in order to save a few bucks, we decided to use the tube instead of to pay for taxis. And that meant that we needed to drag our two huge suitcases from place to place. Now, being the chivalrous guy that I am, um, I didn't want Ruth to have to carry the suitcases, so I tried to do it myself. But trying to get two huge suitcases through one of those little turnstiles was nearly impossible. I'm sure the locals were having a good laugh watching me try to do it. They're not designed for that. I later learned that there was actually a broader gate through which you could take you know, a whole train if you needed to. But the narrow turnstiles wouldn't allow that. Likewise, the narrow gate requires that we leave some things behind. It requires that we enter, as Jesus indicated in the Sermon on the Mount, poor in spirit. Empty-handed we come to the Lord, offering nothing for our salvation. It requires that we mourn for our sins. How hard it is that we come face to face with our rebellion before the Lord. It requires that we die to our lusts and our passions of the flesh. Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. It requires that we are willing to take on a new ethic for living which in many points is diametrically opposed to the ethic of the crowd. It requires that we embrace a new master, a new king, and that we're willing to suffer, feeling like an outsider in the very world that we live. Now, at first glance, the narrow road doesn't seem that appealing. It may even repulse the casual observer. But mark what Jesus says is the destiny of each way. He says the broad road leads to destruction, but the narrow road leads to life. On the end point of the broad road, John Stott is instructive. He says, consider soberly what he says. Everything good will be destroyed in hell. Love and loveliness, beauty and truth, joy, peace, and hope, and that forever. It is a prospect too awful to contemplate without tears. For the broad road is suicide road. That's why Jesus urges us to enter by the narrow gate. We do this by coming to Jesus, who himself is the gate, and we come to him in repentance and faith. That places us on the hard road, which Jesus has trod before us, and now he accompanies us, dispensing grace and mercy in our time of need, as is promised in the book of Hebrews. And that road ultimately leads to life which in the words of the Apostle Paul is actually gaining Christ. And so we enter the narrow gate, we travel the hard road, knowing that at the end we have the most blessed prize. We gain Christ. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, The man who does not consider his destination is a fool. The man who makes traveling an end in itself is illogical and inconsistent. That is the great argument of the Bible from beginning to end. Consider your latter end. Consider your destination and where that sort of life leads. 
And so before we move on, may I ask, which way are you going? By what road are you traveling? May God give us grace to heed the call of Jesus to enter by the narrow gate. Now there's a second call to action which Jesus gives. And those are found in verses 15 and 16. And I'm saying it's a call to examine the voice. Along the road, we will encounter numerous voices, and it's important to know how we might distinguish the false from the true. Let's look together at these verses, starting at verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. So as we travel the road, Jesus warns us to beware. Be on your alert. Be in a constant state of readiness. And for what are we to be so watchful? He says it's false prophets. And who are these false prophets? Well, there have been many suggestions as to who they were in Jesus' day, but I think if we just stick close to the text, we'd have to say, first of all, that they are false. A true prophet claims divine inspiration and in that context proclaims truth. A false prophet also claims divine inspiration, claims authority, but instead peddles untruths, peddles lies. A second thing we can learn from the text is that false prophets come to us appearing to be the real deal. They seem safe to us. That's why we're apt to get sucked into their appeal. Jesus says that they come to us in sheep's clothing. It's interesting to note that in the days of the prophets, their common garb was a mantle of sheepskin. And so if you saw somebody walking around with a sheepskin garment, it would indicate that they were among the prophets. And you'd likely invite them in with a listening ear. So first, they are false. Secondly, they seem safe for us, at least on the surface. So often, when lies are peddled, they take a piece of the truth and they present it. And you go, well, who wouldn't believe it? And then, upon further examination, you begin to unravel But there's a third description, and Jesus says that they come to you and they're really ravenous wolves. They come disguised as they are, peddling their untruths, but it results in our being devoured. It results in our destruction as might come to a sheep confronted by a hungry lion. You know, all this sounds so similar to what Adam and Eve encountered in the garden. They encountered a false voice, seemingly one that was directing them to gain more for their life. But in the end, it led to nowhere but death. A death more devastating than they could have ever imagined. And so how do we avoid getting sucked into the destructive messages of the false prophets? Well, Jesus says two times you will recognize them by their fruits. And when Jesus says something twice, we should take note. You'll know them by their fruits. He then offers an explanation of what he means by using illustrations from creation. He asks, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? 
Actually, I think the verse could be better translated not as a question, but actually as a declaration saying, in no way are grapes gathered from thorn bushes. In no way do you get figs from thistles. That doesn't happen. That's not their design. That's not what a thorn bush or a thistle is at its core. To fortify his point, Jesus says positively, healthy trees bear good fruit. Diseased trees bear bad fruit. And so if a tree at its core is sound, it'll likely produce good fruit. Fruit that's useful, excellent in nature and characteristic. Well adapted to be consumed and enjoyed. But if a tree at its core is rotten, so will its fruit be. It will produce fruit that is of little or no value, tasteless, rotten, not fit for us to consume. To further nail down his point, Jesus then says the reverse. He says a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. The point being made that the man or the prophet, what he is at his core, will eventually and necessarily come out in the fruit of life. Now this begs the question, what are we looking for in the fruit? How do we judge the fruit? Are there tests that we can employ to help us? In my research, I came up with several tests that I think are helpful, and I want to share those with you. The first test is the character test. That means we look at the moral quality of the prophet's life. We ask, is it consistent with the Sermon on the Mount? Does the prophet evidence being poor in spirit? Is he ever seen to mourn for his sins? Is he known for his mercy toward others? Do you ever see him hunger and thirst for righteousness? Is he practicing his spiritual disciplines in such a way as only to be seen by God? Is he focused on kingdom issues and not worried about temporal things? Is he careful with his judgments? In short, do we see the character of Christ on display? And I want to pause for a moment and say, if we require perfection of any of these tests, all will fall short. We won't find a perfect prophet except Jesus, but what we're looking for is a life trajectory, something that characterizes a life. The second test is the doctrinal test. We have to ask if this man's teaching, this prophet's teaching, squares with the Bible. John Calvin states, All doctrines must be brought to the word of God as the standard. For in judging of false prophets, the rule of faith, that is scripture, holds the chief place. Now we should note that we should not only look at what the man preaches, but we should also look at what is left out of the preaching. Lloyd-Jones says that the false prophet has no narrow gate in his gospel. He says, and I quote, he has nothing which is offensive to the natural man. He pleases all. The false prophet is always a very comforting preacher because it never disturbs and never makes you feel uncomfortable. You carry on as you are. You are all right. You don't have to worry about the straight gate or the narrow way or this particular doctrine or that. If you look at the life of Jesus, you see that he did not leave out the unsettling declarations, but he often used them to shake up the complacent and the errant. His teaching of the narrow gate is but one example the third test is the test of motive. We should ask, whose glory is the prophet seeking? 
Jesus speaks directly to this in John 7, 18. He says, the one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. I like what Barclay adds here. He says, Denny once said, no, no man can at one and the same time prove that he is clever and that Christ is wonderful. Prestige is the last thing the great teachers desire. There's a kind of teacher who uses his message as a setting for himself. The false prophet is interested in self-display, but the true prophet desires self-obliteration. That leads us to the final test. We call it the influence test. It seeks to know what kind of influence the prophet's teaching has in the life of the hearers. Does the teaching produce love of God and love of, love of others? Does it produce the, the, the fruit of the Spirit and Christ-like character? Does it produce faith and hope and patience and even stability in the midst of trial and affliction? Does it equip the believer to pursue the bringing in of all things under the reign of Jesus? Or does it only contribute to further division among the body? And so there are four tests that help us discern the truthfulness of the voices that we will hear while we are on the road. The test of character, the test of doctrine, the test of motive, the test of influence. And why is it important to exercise discernment in this way? Well, verse 19 says, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. The destination of the false prophet is destruction. He'll be cut down and thrown into the fire by, by the one who is truth, the ultimate judge. And what do we think the destination will be of those who follow their teaching? It will not likely be the abundant life to which Jesus is calling us. And so as we draw to a close, I'd like to affirm three calls to action. The first is the call of Jesus to enter the narrow gate. If you're one here today who has never heeded the call, to enter the narrow gate, I urge you to consider it today. The gate requires that you come through repentance and faith. Repent of any good works you think you have to offer to the Lord. Those things will only keep you from entering. You come empty-handed as far as your works are concerned. Repent as well from your sin. Let Christ shine his light upon your heart to reveal the rebellion, to reveal the self-seeking and then turn in faith and throw yourself at his mercies. Receive from him the grace of forgiveness that will open you up to his loving companionship on the hard road. Remembering that in the end it leads to life. Which, which is, as we said earlier, it is gaining Christ. You know, when you think about calls to action, you might be thinking, okay, Pastor Ron is telling me to pull up my bootstraps, more effort. But if you judge this call rightly, you will see that this call actually obliterates self-effort and calls you to throw yourself at the mercies of Jesus Christ. And that is the only correct starting place. The second call I want to offer is to have compassion for those who are traveling on the broad road. They're taking the road of ease. They're giving into their fallen passions. 
They're happily following the crowd. But they're unaware that their destination will lead them to nowhere good. Brothers and sisters, have compassion on them. Live in such a way, speak in such a way to show them that there's another road. Albeit it's a hard road, but it's a road that leads to life. Live in such a way by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who lives in you, that compels them to stop and to consider their life and to consider their end. May God help us to be that kind of people. Thirdly and finally, it's a call to examine the voices to which you are listening to. You know, as a pastor, I get concerned <clears throat> how readily we are taking in the truth claims of our world. I see it so much in our young people, but it's not just a young people issue, it's, it's all ages. We spend hours on the internet, trolling social media, drinking in so much information, never really examining it, never really walking through the test to see if, it, if, if the messages are valid. And as a result, we are impoverishing our souls. As I said earlier, sometimes those messages, they, they, they come out with a bit of truth and at first they sound good and, and you say, oh, well, who wouldn't believe this? But further examination would show that the core of the message is rotten and it will not lead you to life. And so the call is to exercise more discernment in what you let in. And how do you do that best? Well, most of us know that those who are good at detecting counterfeit currency, they don't focus on what, what is false, but they focus on the true thing. They study the real thing so much so that when they're confronted with the counterfeit, they immediately know it. The same is true of us. If we're going to be able to discern the voices of the world, we are going to have to be people who are given to the study of the scriptures. J.C. Ryle is helpful here. He said, what is the best safeguard against false teaching? Beyond all doubt, the regular study of the word of God with prayer for the teaching of the Holy Spirit. The Bible was given to be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. The man who reads it aright will never be allowed greatly to err. It is neglect of the Bible which makes so many a prey to the false teachers whom they hear. Nothing supplies false prophets with followers so much as spiritual sloth. Happy is he who prays over his Bible and knows the difference between truth and error in religion. There is a difference, and we were meant to know it and to use our knowledge. So the call is to make it a priority, to drink in the Word, to study the Word, to read Christian literature that's saturated with the Word, so when you're confronted with a message, you'll automatically go, something about that doesn't seem right. May God give us grace to heed his calls to action. Well, at this time, we'd like to draw our attention to the Lord's table. And you can just imagine that <clears throat> there's a table in front of me. Take out your uh, bread and, and the cup, if you would. This is the table of the Lord. The bread represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for us. The cup represents his blood poured out for the forgiveness of sin. The table is set for those who have entered the narrow gate, who've acknowledged their need of forgiveness, who've come to faith to the only one who has the power to save, Jesus Christ. 
And I want to say, if you're here today and you've never entered the narrow gate, Scripture suggests that it's best if you don't partake of the elements. But I want to encourage you that if that's true of you, don't let this moment go by without you considering Jesus' call to enter the narrow gate. Come to him. Acknowledge your, your sins. Your, 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 you go your own way. You do your own thing. You're rebellion against your creator. Look to him for forgiveness of sins. And then lay your life before him to be led the rest of the days of your life. And if you offer a prayer like that to the Lord in, in earnestness, then this table actually is your table as well. I invite you to consider Jesus' call even this morning. For the rest of us who know Christ personally, I want to encourage you to use the musical interlude. You can sing if you want, but also consider to pray, to thank God for what he's done in Jesus Christ. Ask him to examine your heart and to see if there's any way in you that is, that is breaking that communion. That's what we call this communion. It strengthens our union with Jesus. Ask him to reveal anything in your heart, any untruth that he would bring it to the surface so that you can forsake it and enjoy a full union with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to begin by praying and then continue the prayer you're talking to God. And then after we sing, we will take, partake of the elements. Father, thank you that you love us so. That you were willing to give us your all. You laid it down on a cross. And if the tortures of the cross weren't enough, O oh Lord, even worse was your taking upon yourself our sin that which separated us from you. Lord, you had one purpose in mind, to restore us, to bring us back, to bring us into union with you. Oh Lord, thank you for that communion. You are the way, the truth, and the life. You walk with us on the way, you speak truth that we need to hear. And all along the way and into eternity, O oh Lord, you are that life. Father, hear now our individual prayers to you.
Jesus loves you. He gave his body to be broken for you. Let's receive it with gladness. His precious blood was poured out for your forgiveness so that you could be reunited with your creator and know his life and know his love and his grace. So you receive it with joy. Let's continue our singing and our celebration. Talk to the person who brought you. We'd love to introduce you to Jesus Christ and the life that he came to give. And now a benediction from the book of Jude. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Go in peace.